world news tonight. Crash landed. Chartered private jet crashes onto a highway near an airport on the outskirts of Malaysia's capital. Privacy breached. US officials begin investigating threats against members of the grand jury overseeing Donald Trump's legal battle. Promise of pigs. Organ donation gap further shrink as scientists find pig kidney to be functional in human body for over a month. Robo rage. Human-like robots steal the show at World Robot Conference in Beijing. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Sanuvi Mudanayaka. Good evening, you are joining us on World News. We begin as fresh tragedy struck Malaysia. At least 10 people have been killed after a small private aircraft crash on a highway on the outskirts of Kuala Lumpur. All eight people on board were killed as well as two on the ground when the jet crashed into a motorbike and a car while attempting to land. The country's civil aviation authority said the flight was on its way from the northern island of Langkawi to the Sultan Abdul Aziz Azhar Airport near Kuala Lumpur. Transport Minister Anthony Luke said that just minutes before landing, the plane veered off its flight path and plunged to the ground. Witnesses stated that the aeroplane exploded on impact. Video shared on social media showed a plane nose diving into the ground in a bowl of flames and sending plumes of black smoke into the air. Police announced later that the black box cockpit voice recorder had been recovered. Among the dead was 53-year-old Juhari Harun, a senior politician in the government of the central state of Pahang. His aide was also killed. On X, Malaysian Prime Minister Anwar Ibrahim sent his condolences to the families of the dead. Over in Pakistan, arrests have been made after violence was sparked by claims that two Christian men had torn pages from the copy of the Quran. Authorities have arrested more than 100 people in connection with the unprecedented mob attack on 21 churches of the Christian community in Punjab, even as the government ordered a high-level probe into the riots of a blasphemy allegations. Paramilitary troops were called in to guard a Christian settlement in eastern Pakistan on Thursday, where a Muslim mob vandalized and torched several churches and scores of houses. The violence unfolded after two men were accused of desecrating the Quran in Jaramwala, the industrial district of Faisalabad, police said. Rioters were demanding that the two accused men be handed over to them, though the pair had already fled their homes. This protester accused the police of failing to act to bring the accused men to justice. When a man smuggles cocaine, he is apprehended within hours, but the blasphemers have not been arrested after 24 hours, he says. Police should side with Muslims, he adds. The attack started on Wednesday, continuing for more than 10 hours without any intervention by police who were at the scene, witnesses said. People's houses were burned down. Three or four churches were set on fire. Whatever happened could have been settled through negotiations by sitting down together, which did not happen. Now things have reached a stage where rangers have been called in. The entire city is in lockdown. Police denied the accusations and said security forces at the scene had prevented an even worse situation. Salim Kasim Mass's home was among those gutted. When I saw my house, I felt a jolt in my heart and I thought I was going to fall. I immediately came out of my house and sat down. We have not committed any crime. All this is a grave injustice towards us. Residents said they witnessed thousands of Muslims, led by local clerics, carrying iron rods, sticks, knives and daggers during the rioting. The troops have cordoned off the Christian colony, blocking all entry and exit points with barbed wire, while hundreds of Christians took refuge in a nearby district. Police arrested over 100 suspected rioters, the Pakistani government confirmed in a statement, adding that an inquiry had been ordered into the incident. Local and national government leaders pledged support for the Christian community in the aftermath. This is provincial government leader Mohsin Nakvi. The losses that you people have suffered, as a government, as a Muslim, as a human being, it is my duty to compensate your loss and restore it to its original form. This is my and my team's promise to you 
that within three or four days, we will restore your properties to their original state. Our teams are already working on it. Blasphemy is punishable by death in Pakistan. And although no one has ever been executed for it, many accused people have been lynched by outraged crowds. Rights groups say accusations of blasphemy are sometimes used to settle scores. That has left hundreds of people in prison after being accused, because judges often put off trials, fearing retribution if they are seen as being too lenient, according to the rights groups. Moving on to shocking revelations, names, photographs, social media profiles and even the home addresses purposely belonging to members of the Fulton County Grand Jury that voted to indict former President Donald Trump and 18 co-defendants are circulating on social media, with experts saying that some anonymous users are calling for violence against them. Law enforcement officials are investigating threats against members of the grand jury that are overseeing former U.S. President Donald Trump's legal battle in the state of Georgia. Threats that reportedly came after the personal information of jury members was leaked online. That's according to the sheriff's office in Fulton County, Georgia, the center of that legal battle. It's where Trump and associates were charged earlier this week with conspiring to illegally subvert the 2020 election results in that state. It reported that names, addresses, photographs, and social media profiles purporting to belong to the jury were being shared online. It's been high security around Fulton County's courthouse in Atlanta over Trump's indictment. State government policy is that indictments that are made public record include the names of grand jurors, but no other personally identifiable information. The sheriff's office says it's working with both state and federal agencies to track down the origin of the threats. France encounters severe weather as mainland France is facing a heat wave with temperatures of 40 degrees Celsius Forecast for Toulouse and Lyon. People are out and about in the streets of Aix-en-Provence in southern France despite the 35 degree heat. Holidaymakers know they need to protect themselves. Drink lots of fresh water, have cold showers more than usual to freshen up, and avoid too much sun. I've got my hat, glasses, and sand cream. Temperatures are forecast to rise to 38 degrees in Aix-en-Provence on Sunday and to even higher in Toulouse, where it will be 40 degrees this weekend. That temperature is forecast for Lyon on Tuesday. The heat wave is due to heat moving up from North Africa and a weather phenomenon known as a heat dome. A heat dome is a type of high pressure but at all levels. It is a lid that traps hot air near the ground, with, at the same time, downward drafts compressing the air. It's a bit like what happens when you inflate a tire of a bike. The compression warms the air. The heat dome traps hot air, leading to a spike in temperatures. It blocks clouds and rain. It's expected this weather phenomenon will be more common in the future. We know that climate change raises the frequency and intensity of heat waves and lengthens the season in which heat waves can develop. This heat wave is forecast to be the hottest of the summer in France. French weather forecasters are saying that thermometers will not begin to fall until the middle or even the end of next week. For Egyptians grown used to a decade of reliable power supplies and boasts of vast investments in generation, a wave of rolling blackouts came as a shock, shaking faith in President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi's records month before an election. This is what the streets of Egypt look like at night. Rolling blackouts have become a symbol of its economic crisis, as the country faces record inflation and a weakening currency. And that's a big problem for President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi just months before the country heads to the polls. When there is a power cut, I feel suffocated. I feel depressed. It feels like living in a grave. Residents haven't experienced this level of service cuts since the uprising years ago, when frequent outages helped turn the public against Egypt's first democratically elected leader, Mohamed Morsi. Sisi led his ouster in July 2013. 
Critics like Gamila Ismail, head of Al Dastoor Party, one of the opposition groups, see echoes of the past today. Power cuts are an indication of failing economic policies and in management. In fact, power cuts have not happened since 2013. It takes us back to many years ago, to a certain political moment. People feel that we are heading into a certain direction that might be like one that took place years ago. Sisi took power in 2014 on promises of stability and development. A former army chief who's overseen a far-reaching crackdown on political dissent. He's widely expected to secure a third term in elections, due by early 2024. But Egypt's economic troubles are shaking faith in his record. Sisi has shifted blame largely on other factors like the global health crisis and the war in Ukraine. This is Mustafa Bakri, a pro-Sisi member of parliament. He acknowledges that the economy is suffering from crises, but likens it to the financial troubles in the U.S. He says the Egyptian people will bear the burden because they learned their lesson after the 2011 protests. Analysts say the electricity cuts are partly caused by a dip in Egypt's production of natural gas, which powers most of Egypt's grid and is an important earner of hard currency. The government denies that and says the cuts were simply necessary due to a surge in air conditioner use during unusually hot weather. Residents say they have hit some areas harder than others, fueling a sense of inequality as many complain that life has become tougher due to subsidy reforms, taxes, and soaring prices. We'll be back with more world news after this short commercial break. Welcome back. A military intervention just might be on the horizon. The Economic Community of West African States says it is ready to intervene militarily in coup-hit Niger if diplomatic means to restore constitutional order fails. West African bloc ECOWAS stands ready to intervene militarily if all else fails to reverse a coup in Niger, a senior official said on Thursday. Commissioner for Political Affairs, Peace and Security, Abdel Fattah al Musa said the valiant forces of West Africa are ready to answer the call of duty. That was as he addressed army generals from member states who were meeting in Ghana. By all means available, constitutional order will be restored in the country. And this meeting today bears testimony to that. Military officers in Niger deposed President Mohamed Bazoum on July 26. They've defied calls from the United Nations, ECOWAS and Western powers to reinstate him. That prompted West African heads of state to order a standby force to be assembled. Musa listed past ECOWAS deployments in Gambia, Liberia and elsewhere as examples of readiness. He also accused the junta of playing cat and mouse with the bloc. They are pretending, you know, that oh, now they are ready for talks. But even us... They are telling them that they are ready, ready for talks. They are still seeking reasons, reasons to uh, justify an unjustifiable coup d'etat. Musa also strongly criticised the junta's announcement that it planned to put Bazoum on trial for treason. The United Nations, European Union and ECOWAS have all expressed concerns over the conditions of his detention. The junta has said it's open to talks to resolve the crisis. In Niger's capital, Niamey, large crowds have taken part in protests against ECOWAS and in favour of the coup leaders. Demonstrators accuse ECOWAS of being manipulated by foreign powers and say they reject outside intervention. Now on to the updates of the historic Camp David Summit where President Joe Biden hopes to cement ties between Japan and South Korea. The leaders of Japan and South Korea are coming to the U.S. for a weekend summit with President Joe Biden, part of a bid by Washington to strengthen ties between two key American allies. Tokyo and Seoul have a long history of acrimony and distrust, but tensions are easing amid rising concerns over an increasingly aggressive China and an erratic North Korea. Here is Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida before departing for the summit Thursday. <laughs> As the international norms built on freedom and openness are shaken, 
are bilateral relationships with the United States and South Korea that have been at its strongest will be the foundation of this historical opportunity to bolster the strategic relationship between the three countries. South Korean President Yung Tung Yeol focused on the country's neighbor to the north in comments about the summit earlier this week. In order to fundamentally block North Korea's nuclear and missile threats, the Republic of Korea, the United States, and Japan must closely cooperate on reconnaissance assets and share North Korea's nuclear weapons and missiles data in real time. North Korea issued another escalatory threat ahead of the summit, saying it may launch an intercontinental ballistic missile or take other military action to protest the meeting. That's according to a South Korean lawmaker on Thursday, citing the country's intelligence agency. While the summit is unlikely to produce a formal security arrangement that commits the nations to each other's defense, they will likely agree to a mutual understanding about regional responsibilities. The summit comes as the leaders of the three democracies face doubts at home. Only some four in ten voters say they approve of Yoon, Kishida and Biden in the countries they govern. And there is little evidence closer security ties are a priority for ordinary citizens. Moving on to tonight's segment on Road to the White House as we bring you the latest on the only prominent woman in the GOP presidential field, the former South Carolina governor and UN ambassador Nikki Haley. When Haley first launched her bid for president, she proclaimed it was time to put a woman in the White House and that kicking back at bullies hurts more if you are wearing heels. Nonetheless, the prospect of electing a conservative Republican as the nation's first woman president has not proven to be especially tantalizing to GOP voters. Haley remains stuck in the pack, trailing her former boss Donald Trump and Florida Governor Ron DeSantis routinely polling in the single digits. And with the first presidential debate looming, Haley is trying to carve out a lane for herself as a no-nonsense results-oriented underdog who, yes, happens to be the only woman in the race. It's also been a race consumed with attacks on woke ideology, which has made Haley's attempts to elevate her status as a woman and an Indian American tricky with voters who can be suspicious of such assertions of identity. The challenges women face in politics are well understood and impossible to avoid. They're expected to be tough as their male counterparts, yet also sympathetic and motherly. And particularly in the GOP, women can feel constrained in voicing their frustrations with sexism, lest it hurts them with the party's conservative and disproportionately main base. Major breakthrough now as surgeons in the United States have announced that a pig kidney they transplanted into the body of a brain-dead human patient has functioned normally for more than a month, a promising sign in the effort to address widespread organ donation needs. It could be a promising sign for the future of organ donation. According to surgeons in New York, a genetically modified pig kidney functioned normally inside a brain-dead human patient for over a month. It immediately started making urine, which is an extraordinary thing, because you're standing there, the kidney, you know, you take the clamps off and the human blood comes into the pig kidney, turns this beautiful pink color, um, and then a couple of minutes later, urine starts squirting out of the ureter. It's, I think it's given everybody a real renewed sense that this is going to be our reality in the future and it's going to be great. It's the longest without rejection that a pig kidney has functioned in a human body, albeit a brain-dead one. For years, medical experts have attempted xenotransplantation, animal-to-human transplants, but human immune systems have always attacked the foreign tissues. Using genetically modified pig organs brings the hope of a closer match. On Wednesday, surgeons in Alabama reported another success, a week's worth of kidney function in another deceased human body. The fact that these kidneys were able to not just produce urine but really provide life-sustaining function is truly a remarkable feat. Researchers in New York will continue to monitor the kidneys' functionality for a second month. In the U.S. alone, over 100,000 people remain on the transplant list waiting for organs, and thousands die each year waiting.
Welcome back. For more news, let's take around the world with me. Paleontologists believe that a fossil found in Brazil might be the key to understanding the precursors of dinosaurs and pterosaurs. The fossil of an animal was found by Brazilian paleontologist Rodrigo Tempmuller in the central part of the Rio Grande do Sol state. A strong earthquake of 6.3 magnitude struck the Colombian capital Bogota, according to the U.S. Geological Survey, prompting frightening residents to flee into the streets and leading a woman to fall to her death. The Russian Defense Ministry said in a statement that Russian and Chinese Navy ships have been jointly patrolling the Pacific Ocean and holding naval exercises in the East China Sea. Heavy rains, including hail, lash La Plata, Argentina, disrupting the lives of local residences by causing flooding and overflows that affected streets and houses. Russian officials stated that a Ukrainian drone smashed into a building in central Moscow after Russian air defenses shot it down, disrupting air traffic at all the civilian airports of the Russian capital. That is all we have for you on World News tonight. If you miss any of today's programs, you can always rewatch by touching us on YouTube channel, youtube.com slash otherderna English. We're leaving you tonight in China's capital Beijing, where visitors were treated to a display of vivid humanoid robots at the World Robot Conference. Thank you for watching. Good night.